you for joining us for a 25 Backstory. I'm Rondell Joseph. He followed in the steps of his late father who died two decades ago, but he admits that there was some unhappiness in the life of TV news. I sit down with former Chicago journalist, now media consultant, Rafer Weigel, who talks about the life of being Tim Weigel's son, life in acting, and the long-awaited story of what really happened to him at ABC7 before he left and chose to come back home a few years later. Take a look. Alrighty, Rafer, welcome to 25 Backstory. You're actually the first person I could, that's ever been in my series. That's a Weigel. Oh, well, I, I appreciate that very much. I'm honored to represent the family. And, uh, well, you got a great setup there, Rondell. I mean, you got a nice camera, you got good uh, sound. And, uh, you know, me being a t former TV guy, I'm embarrassed by my presentation. But I appreciate you having me on. Not a problem. Okay, so did your interest in broadcasting and film kind of run in your blood or basically within the family? Yes, it is a generational thing for us Weigels. You're far too young to remember, but my father... God rest his soul, was an iconic sportscaster in Chicago named Tim Weigel, passed away in 2001 from a brain tumor. But he was an iconic figure in the, in the uh, well, he started as a newspaper writer in the 70s and then in the 80s and the 90s. And I'm 100% convinced that the character uh, Anchorman, Ron Burgundy, was based on him because he did wear a burgundy jacket. He did have a, uh, a mustache and his news anchor was Bill Curtis at the time. And this was in 1990, 91, when, when uh, Will Ferrell was at Second City. So, uh, and my grandfather founded WCIU, uh, which is Weigel Broadcasting, back in the 60s to create programming specifically for uh, African-Americans and immigrants in the city of Chicago. Okay, Rafer, so where did you get your start off in the TV industry growing up? Uh, so just by osmosis, just being around my father covering the Bears and the Bulls in the 90s during those championship era uh, years and uh, Cubs and the White Sox, uh, not nearly as uh, successful but uh, just being around and growing up in it, I just saw, uh, I, I mean, I just saw what it really was, you know, for what, it, but it's, 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 it looks very glamorous, the industry, but behind the scenes, it can be very frenetic, uh, very stressful, and it just fit with my type A personality. When I got into the business, though, so I started it writing for newspapers, as that was what my father did. I was an actor in the 90s. And then made the transition after he passed away in 01 into broadcasting. So I started writing for the Sun Times and then the Chicago, or sorry, then the LA Times covering high school sports before I then moved into TV news, first in San Diego, then Sacramento, then sports at CNN in Atlanta, and then sports in Chicago, news in St. Louis, and then news in Chicago. So just being around it. Um, but there, the industry, you know, it's funny when my dad in the 90s, when I told him I wanted to go into this industry, he said, you know what, this industry is changing. It's not the way it used to be. And he was he was against it. He did not he he did not have any optimism for the future of the industry. I I have similar issues with it now. I don't feel like it's as passionate about storytelling as it used to be. But you know, of course, as a guy who's no longer working in TV news, that's probably easy for me to say. Okay, so you've done both sports and news over the years. So what was it like stepping away from the sports side? Because you wouldn't be the first person television personality who was in Chicago who's done it. I know. Your father was one who did it, uh, Corey McFerrin, Ryan Baker recently, and of course the late Warner Saunders, may God rest his soul. Uh, what was it like going over to the news side, basically? Well, it was interesting because, you know, it, you know, it was Ron Majors, who uh, the, 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 the famous news anchor in Chicago retired. He said oh, yeah. the difference between sports and, and news is he's like, as a sports, you're the uh, you're, you're the you're, you know, you're the guitarist. You step in, you do your guitar solo, you wail, you rile, you rile up the crowd, and then you step back, and then you let the lead guitarist take over. So when you're a news guy, you're the lead guitarist. You're the point guard dishing it to everybody else. It's not about you, as in me. It's about that person. It's about that reporter. It's about the sports guy. But when you're the sports guy, that's when you step in, you shine. Look at me. Look at me. Hey, let's have some fun. So it, you know, it took a little while for me to make that adjustment and go, you know what? It's not about me. It's about the viewer. It's about my co-anchor. It's about the reporters. And all I'm here to do is just distribute the basketball. Uh, so that was something that I, you just you had to do over, uh, you know, over time with 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 various reps. But then going into morning news, you do have a little bit more of an opportunity to show off a little bit of your personality. But you have to be careful because, you know, you're going from very serious, heavy stories to lighter stories and you have to be careful and you know economical in your transition so it's just one of those things you just learn by doing you know i'm going to add this in 
Ron Majors was one of the biggest reasons I went into TV news. No kidding. Diane Burns, Kathy Brock, Jared Taft, and Mark Jim Greco on the ABC 17. They were big reasons I stepped into this business so many years ago. You're you're far too young to to be looking up to all those people. Those are all great people. Hey. Uh, Diane Burns, really great woman. Uh, yeah, Margie and Greco. I loved working for him. Was sorry to see him leave uh, ABC Seven, but uh, but you're you're clearly a student of Chicago broadcasting. <laughs> now, while you were at Fox Thirty Two, you became the trending reporter during the Jesse Smollett case. So, what was it like getting so much detail before Chuck Gowdy could even get the detail? Well, I, you know what, when it comes to this will be a, a lesson for anybody going into news. You know, I was able to be able to um, have access to information regarding that story simply because I developed good relationships with the Chicago Police Department from being out in the field. So, you know, the, a, a lot of people want to get behind the anchor desk. But, you know, me being the anchor from 4 a.m. to 7 a.m. or 6 a.m., I would then go out into the re- field and report. So I, I would make relationships with people. So when the story broke and everybody who lives in Chicago, when they heard that story was like, really? I called the police department and I got in touch with a detective who was working on the case or who, or I should say was close to the case. And he started giving me, you know, a counter narrative and I initially started reporting on it. I got a lot of, um, pushback and a lot of flack, um, but it wasn't it wasn't politically motivated on my end. It was just me reporting what I was being told by sources that were close to the investigation. Uh, there's an old adage in journalism, if your mother loves you or says she loves you, double check it. And so, you know, a lot of other news outlets had erroneously reported Jesse Smollett attacked in racist, racially motivated attack, as opposed to the truthful headline, Jesse Smollett says he was attacked by, but like the Sun Times, the Washington Post, you know, really big outlets actually went with it as fact uh, before it was ever uncovered. And so I just stuck to the facts as I knew them. And I became this, I, I, I got all this attention and it was interesting. I remember going on like Laura Ingram and Sean Hannity and they were like, you know, you stuck to your guns. I said, look, if the Chicago Police Department told me that Jesse Smollett was actually attacked by two white supremacists wearing MAGA hats, carrying bleach and a rope, honestly, I would have reported that because it's a better story anyway. But they said, no, I just stuck with the facts. And, uh, you know, it's not a good state of it's not a good statement on the condition or the situation of journalism that simply sticking to the facts ended up bringing me a lot of attention when all I did was I just had a good source in the investigation. As I can see, because you were not only were you this is right before you even got promoted to anchoring Good Day Chicago for four to six with Roseanne Tez. Now, let's jump over to this one. Now, back in March, you were one of the former ABC seven on air personnel who broke their silence and to what really happened to you and why you had left for Fox two in St. Louis. Did you feel that the attempted firing was a sign that the GM possibly was going to try to pull a stent on you the way Joe Ahern pulled a stent on your father back in the 1990s? Boy, you really have done your homework, my friend. Yes, I. it's a very subjective business. And Joe Ahern did let my father go back in 1990 after he was just voted the most popular sportscaster in Chicago. Um, when I got to Chicago, you know, full disclosure, following in my father's footsteps, I put a lot of pressure on myself to live up to that hype. And I really, honestly, and initially, I tried way too hard. And, uh, and, and, you know, that, that was just because I, I didn't want to fail rather than just trusting the process. And eventually with Mark G and Greco's guidance, I just settled in. I was like, you know what, my here, I, I'm just here to report the sports, the facts, the, you know, the who, what, when, where, why, and make Mark G and Greco's job easier. And then it worked out fine. But John Eiler, the general manager decided, yeah, he wasn't on a fan of mine. Uh, which was actually allowed me to then reach out and 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 test the news waters. And then St. Louis did give me an opportunity to be a news anchor down there. Um, and then when Fox 32 made the offer for me to become a news uh, reporter anchor there, I took it because it was my hometown. This is my story is a cautionary tale. You know what happened to me? I lost my job at Fox 32. And, you know, the rea- the reality was, is I, you know, when my father passed away, I was so obsessed with climbing that ladder and and reaching that pinnacle of becoming a news anchor in Chicago that I put all my energy on my professional life and nothing on my personal life. I ended up in Chicago as a news anchor. Uh, My marriage fell apart. My son moved to Vegas with his mother. Uh, The woman I fell in love with post-divorce I left behind in St. Louis. I got to Chicago. I'm there and I was miserable, but I wasn't really, 
I didn't, I didn't get any personal help. I didn't do, talk to a psychiatrist, psychologist, anything. Uh, and I made some personal decisions that were self-destructive. Do I think I should have lost my job over it? No, I don't. But at the end of the day, it made me a better person. It caused me to go through a realignment process and realize that, and you know, and this is my, the reason I share this with potential people wanting to aspire in the business. I made it so much about serving my ego and my career that I lost sight of that. Ultimately, if you're a real journalist, you want to be of service to the viewer. You're there to serve the story, tell the truth, hold uh, officials accountable, you know, be, be the fourth estate. That's a check. You know, we're part of the checks and balances. And, uh, and I did let a lot of it go to my head, including all the Jesse Smollett coverage. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not happy to admit it, but I'm a proud, I'm, I'm proud to admit that it ended up reshaping my whole, my whole outlook on life. And now, you know, going into private business, uh, we're a news for hire. We tell stories for nonprofits that are making a difference. We tell stories that matter. And you know what? It's a lot better than covering dead bodies under sheets in Inglewood. I'll be honest. I mean, you know, that to me, the, the local news perpetuates a lot of stereotypes when it comes to the South and the West Side reporting on murders without context. And I think that as they lose more market share, they resort to older habits of if it bleeds, it leads. You remember like the Chuck Gowdy's of the 70s and the 80s. That's when they would really do good in-depth journalism. I don't see that as much anymore. And quite frankly, the state of the business worries me a lot because there's so few resources. The reporting, in my opinion, is not quite as good. But I still am, I'm, I'm a big believer in the importance of journalism. <laughs> Now, let's shift gears. You've also done some work on the film side. Just, of course, last March, we caught you on NBC's Chicago Fire. I'm not going to lie to you. I almost got a cameo in it about three years ago. <laughs> hey, you still can. You're young, man. <laughs> now, do you intend on doing any more, like, cameos on certain shows in the coming future or anything like that? I got an agent in Chicago. I have gone on a couple of auditions. You know, I started out as an, as an actor in the 90s. It was part of my... Um, you know, Weigel quest of, you know, why growing up Tim Weigel's son, I was under the misconception that fame equaled success uh, because he was so successful. He could walk into any restaurant in Chicago and they'd get him a table and, and everywhere he went, he was mobbed. So when you're a kid and you see that and that's your model for success, you think, oh, so I went to Hollywood not to be an actor. I went to be a movie star. That was not it wasn't about just being a successful actor. Uh, and I had some good success at it, but I wasn't happy because you're always when you again, if you go into your career with ego first, you will always be disappointed because you're always focusing on what you're not getting as opposed to being grateful for what you are getting. And when you're in that space of gratitude, that's when more good things come to you. And I'm 50 years old and I'm just now figuring that out. So when I walked into that audition, I was like, there's no way I'm going to get this. I went in there. I had fun. I left. They called. You got the part. Well, since then, I've gone on maybe three or four auditions. Um, but I, you know, I, I, I keep that open. I love acting. It's a lot of fun. And it's part of storytelling. I love being a part of the, I love storytelling. So, Reefer, do you happen to have any advice for those who intend on going into the broadcasting business or even into media consulting for that matter? So the, 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 the one thing that really did help me and that I learned from my father was be a good writer first. Because the writing and how you tell the story is everything. As you know, you're a student of Chicago news. And any story that's going on, every station is there. Everyone is covering the exact same stories. Why are they going to watch you? Okay, if you're an attractive looking person and you dress, whatever, maybe that might be one reason. That certainly you know, seems to be the case in you know, things like with weather. But when it comes to reporting, it's ultimately going to be on your ability to communicate that story in a way that is engaging. So if you write that story well in a way that is engaging to the viewer, doesn't bring attention back to you, but is there to make the viewer informed. And if you're doing sports entertained on top of it, that's what's going to get you to succeed. There's two different kinds of writing. There's writing for the page and there's writing for the ear. And they're both different. You have to learn how to do, you know, and I had to learn going from newspapers to TV, how to write for TV. In TV, one or two sentences sometimes is all you need. Whereas with, with news, you get a whole paragraph. So you have, so, you, so I really would say that's the number one foundation. And also, you know what? You have to really be passionate about it. You have to be passionate about journalism from a standpoint of what it means to the community, not, a me not what it means for your career. Don't go into TV just because you want to be a news anchor. You know, I, I did that and, and, and lost my way. And I'm not saying others, you know, have gotten there. There are people that have followed that same path and have done very well and are very good at what they do. 
But if you do it for from a service standpoint and because you have to do it and don't expect to make a lot of money. And if you're okay with all of those things, then journalism needs you. We need good journalists in today's day and age more than ever. And people like yourself, I want to say you're a good you're a good example because you're a student of history. And I think that's a really important thing. I'm not blowing smoke here. I mean, there's so many young anchors I've worked with who don't even, you know, who've never heard of, you know, just things that happened in the 90s. And I'm not saying you need to study every, you know, encyclopedia or Wikipedia page, but you have to know things that have happened in the past to put into context the way things are happening now. And that is especially true if you're covering politics and also if you're covering sports. And the only reason I had asked that question regarding your coming to defense on Jim Greco was because I, of course, came across your comment on Facebook about the side note that you added when you said Ahern had dismissed your father and how you admitted and broke your silence about how Eiler was going after you. Because I know a lot of people have been looking at WLS in recent years, not only with just what happened to you, but with what happened to Mike Kaplan, Sylvia Perez, those were the top two that were ousted from the get. And when your when your silence came out, it brought more of a shock to anyone than anything else. I appreciate. I didn't actually think it was gonna it was gonna reverberate in any way. When you when you reached out to me and you mentioned that, I thought, oh well, I was just being honest. I mean, John Idler just you know he 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 wanted to come. He he came in and wanted to put his spin. His first firing was Sylvia Perez, who I think is fantastic. At Fox I State. love Sylvia. Yeah, and then it was you know Mike Kaplan to me is the best weather anchor, weather meteorologist in Chicago, in my opinion. Showed him the door uh, and wanted to show me the door initially. Uh, Jennifer Graves, the news director, God bless her, fought for me. Was like, look, the guy's got a wife and a kid. Uh, and then when Mark G and Greco went to bat for me because. You know, in Mark's words, and I'll t- and I say this freely, Mark was like, "I don't want to have to train somebody else. I just broke you in after two years," and uh, you know, which is Mark's way of you know endorsing me, which I appreciated. But at that point, you know, I was like, I felt slighted. I felt like I didn't want to work at a place where I'm not wanted. And I also, you know, between you and me, well, not between you and me, between you and me and your audience, I, you know, covering sports to me, growing up and following my dad, you know, he really made it fun. He really had a lot of creativity and I really felt it was special. And I just feel that sports coverage now has become so formulaic. We all got the same sound bites. We all get the same interviews. There's really no deviation from it. And it just felt like it felt like working in a factory. Granted, a great factory job. Don't get me wrong. But I felt that, you know, as my father said, if the Bears win or lose, it's not your life really won't change. If a certain candidate wins or loses, your life will change. And he always believed that news was much more important to our social fabric than than sports. He recognized the importance of sports, but the outcomes ultimately really didn't affect our lives. I mean, other than our moods. And so I just felt news was a little bit more important. And it was and honestly, it was a much better fit for me. And by the way, in regards to Sylvia. Keep this right behind me. There's a picture of me, <laughs> Sylvia, and Caitlin over at Fox Chicago. This was taken about three years ago. <laughs> yeah, no, it's cool. It's good to see you again, man. I mean, you know, you're 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 you know the industry, you know the history, you know the biz, and I know she loved you. So yeah, she yeah, yeah. She's, she's got a good heart. She's a good person, and. No, Eitler's still there. I mean, I remember there were other people he wanted to get rid of, too. I'm not going to say any names because I don't want to get sued. But, you know, there were a lot of people he wanted to he wanted to make a lot of changes. And in the end, I'm glad he kept Jennifer Graves there as the news director. I think she's really wonderful. I think she is a highly underrated executive. Um, you know, I, I, I just I, I, the culture there was really, really good. But what's interesting, you know, you work in news and it, it's interesting how how many people who work in news um, complain a lot about where they were. And and I've worked in uh, I've worked in two different stations in Chicago and I've worked in six different stations across the country. And it's always the same. It's just it's a tense industry. It's a stressful job. It is if you're especially if you're a reporter out in the field Um, and they and they expect you to do a lot more with less. So keeping a positive attitude is a really important thing as well. If you find that you're you know, that negativity is 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 causing your your outlook to change you know check yourself before you wreck yourself as a once famously said 20 years ago and um and and listen to your inner voice you know i i wasn't i wasn't happy but i refused to listen to it and it just resulted in, in a lot of self-destructive uh behavior just in terms of my personal relationships 
The thing, the other thing that people need to realize, if you are a broadcaster, your personal brand and your business brand are one in the same. They are not separate, you know, and that was, and that was another thing. My personal brand, my business brand was solid, my professional brand, but my personal brand took a hit. Um, and, and that was enough to lose your job. And that is enough to lose your job in TV news. So you got to make sure that you are, you are just living your life completely, you know, just true to your word, the same guy on camera as you are off camera. And that was my father. He was as nice to the security guard as he was to the CEO. And then when he got in front of that lens, that same personality just came out. And that's, you know, those are good. That's a good way to live by. Mm -hmm. Rayford, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to sit down with me. And of course, if you make any comebacks, you better let us know. Absolutely, my friend. No, I'm in the product. I like producing now. I like being behind the camera now. I, I turn <laughs> I turn other people into stars. And as I say, if, I, if an idiot like me with this hairstyle can get on the anchor desk of Market 3, I can turn anybody into Kim Kardashian. So <laughs> it's been a lot of fun. We've seen you dye your hair at least, what, three or four times? <laughs> <laughs> you got me, man. You got me. It's great to see you. <laughs> great to see you, too. We'll keep in touch.